It's good. This will surely be the best presentation of the day, Randy. Yeah, I'm sure. So Blaze is going to be my timekeeper and keep me on track. I'm going to provide you an update on some of the stuff that we have going on across the state. Uh, several different several different things that I'm going to discuss and talk about. So none of them are going to be in, in great detail. Uh, but I do want to update you on our variety testing network and some of the results that we have. I'll, I'll throw a QR code up here in just a little bit where you can download the most recent version of our publication that has all of the information, all the variety of test results are now in, uh, and we'll have that available for you to download. And we'll also send it out via email to those of you that are on the call today and registered. Give you a quick update on our heat stress work. And then lastly, a little bit about nematode management, some of the work we're doing there. A lot of you have seen this map before. This just outlines all of our locations across the state in terms of our variety testing programs. We have our Upland Cotton Variety Testing Program that's been reviewed and, and talked about several times here today. In 2021, we only had five locations, which is down from our usual eight. Uh, we had one location for a Pima Cotton Variety Trial, which was a strip trial. And then we have our advanced strains trials that you're all familiar with. These are our small plot trials we do in three locations, Safford, Maricopa, and Yuma. And these are primarily uh, experimental varieties, uh, usually one to two years away from release. Some of them are never released, but it gives us an opportunity to look at these at this germplasm. Uh, usually the same exact varieties are evaluated in all three locations. So it gives us an opportunity to evaluate those in, in a wide variety of different climatic conditions from Yuma all the way up to Safford. Uh, we also have two locations in 2021 for our Pima advanced strains. Uh, Rick talked a little bit about this earlier with Gowan. Their variety was entered into those trials, uh, along with other uh, true Pimas and their uh, commercial and, and some experimental varieties. And those were done in 2021 at two locations. So we've got a range from 100 feet to about 4,400 feet where we're testing these varieties. Uh, our variety testing booklet will be coming out soon, the, the, the hard copy. Uh, we'll provide you a digital copy here today, but in that booklet, you'll have all of the lint yield and fiber quality data for every trial. Also, early season data looking at, at uh, seed count, stand counts, and vigor ratings. Uh, Mid-season data on our experimentals looking at plant height, nodes above white flower as an indicator of earliness. And then all of the agronomic data, planting dates, defoliation, uh, termination date. So this is what you'd see. This is, will be one of the sheets. This is the Stanfield location for 2021. Uh, it will have all of the information up here about that, about that trial, um, when it was planted, things of that nature. Uh, we'll also have the, the irrigation type, tillage type, uh, seeding rate, so on and so forth for all of those. Then you'll also see plant populations. These are emergence scores, uh, plants per foot, and then also looking at plant vigor, which is a vigor rating from zero to nine for each variety. And you'll see that for all of the trials that we do across the state. And then probably the most important that we're all interested in is the yield and fiber quality data, which will be presented here with statistical analysis for these different parameters, uh, looking at lint yield, percent lint, and then all the fiber quality. We also calculate, as is kind of standard now in the industry, to calculate a premium or a discount based on fiber quality, and then apply that as a value of a, of a base price for the upland of 52 cents, and then multiply that value or that price by the yield to get a value per acre. And that information, you find all of that in the table. You'll also see a figure like this for each location that will give you an idea of how those varieties performed um, with respect to both fiber quality and lint yield. So on the x-axis, you'll see fiber quality, the premium or discount associated with that variety. And then on the y-axis or the vertical axis, you'll see lint yield. So the, where those lines intersect, it uh, basically gives you four quadrants that show you which varieties fell into that upper right-hand quadrant, which are varieties that perform better than average in terms of both lint yield and fiber quality. And in this particular trial, none of the varieties fell into the below average for both lint yield and fiber quality. But it's a, it's a good way to kind of visualize the data for a given location uh, on how those varieties performed. We also do a lot of variety testing. I don't present this, and this data is not published in, in, uh, in our university trials, but we do a lot of variety testing that are company specific. These are strip trials. These are on-farm trials that we do for Bayer, for BASF, and for Americop. And you will see that data, a lot of the data you see that come from the seed companies are part of these trials that we do for these, for these companies across the state. 
Uh, we had, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 of these trials across Arizona in 2021. So again, here's the QR code and I'll, I'm gonna put this uh, link that you see down here, also the shortened link. I'll put that in the, tech, in the chat for you to also download from there. And again, as I mentioned, if you, we've got your email as you registered for the meeting and we'll send this out via email as well. And then hopefully within the next few weeks, we'll have a hard copy uh, that we can distribute to all of the extension offices and we'll distribute throughout the year at our meetings across the state. But I encourage you to look at as much data as you can. Uh, let me just pop that back up for a second. Look at as much data as you can. Uh, you know, looking at a variety across locations and how it performs and across years is a good indicator of variety stability. I encourage you to look at that information and then use it for making your variety selection. Okay, let's move on to heat stress. I want to update you a little bit. Karen gave a great presentation looking at the work that she's doing related to heat stress. It's very similar to what we're doing. Basically, what we're attempting to do is, is to establish a protocol that we can use to evaluate these varieties in the field and give them a rating of, of heat tolerance, their ability to, to tolerate heat stress in the low desert. Uh, so we're looking at these observations, making observations in flowers and bowls and correlating it to meaningful outcomes like seed set, fruit retention, and yield. So similar to what Karen was doing, we are tagging flowers, looking at, at pollen shed, pollen dehiscence, looking at flower formation, then following those flowers through to maturity to see which ones remain on the plant. And those that remain on the plant, those that are symmetrical and, and uh, fully filled out. Uh, we're also doing end of season plant mapping data, collecting a lot of information end of season by mapping plants out to four positions, uh, looking at seed counts, seed count per bowl, seed index, grams per hundred seed, all of that information is, is being collected. And we're actually going through that information from 2021 currently. Uh, we are evaluating against some commercial controls, Delta Pine 1044 and 1549, which are two that I consider to be very heat tolerant. We also have 4936, I should say, which is an Americot variety that we have next gen variety in our 2021 also as a control. But we're looking at between 30, usually between 30 and 35 and 45 different varieties and evaluating them for heat tolerance in the desert. Uh, I'm gonna skip past this one. Karen showed this slide as well. This kind of gives you an idea of the profile that we're looking at. 2020 was, a, was kind of a banner year. We had over 35 days of level two heat stress. That's the red line that you see. The blue line is 2021. When, we've, when we got into June here in middle of June and we started seeing uh, significant heat stress coming in early and consecutive days of heat stress, uh, I thought we were in for a pretty tough year. But as you can see there towards the end of July when those rains started, things kind of tapered off. But we still did see an effect. And you could see that in a lot of the crop across the state, you could see that bare spot right in the middle of the crop fruiting distribution. Uh, where we lost a lot of fruit. And I think a lot of that can be attributed to the heat stress that we experienced early in the season in 2021. So just kind of as a summary, we're, we're looking at correlations between different things and, and yield. So this is a correlation from 2020 of percent asymmetrical bowls and seed cotton yield. And so we know that there's a good correlation between pollen set and bowl symmetry. And there's a good correlation between bowl symmetry and lint yield. Uh, in 2021, some of our best correlated data was looking at seed cotton yield as a function of percent bowl retention. Now, this is bowl retention in season. This is not looking at our end of season data yet. We don't have all that summarized, but we, we have a good correlation between seed cotton yield and percent bowl retention in season. So again, going back and looking at pollen shed, at pollen, or pollen, uh, uh, pollen shed, pollen dehiscence, and bowl retention, uh, those are very well correlated, and we know that we can correlate bowl retention with seed cotton yield. So moving forward, what our plan is, is to develop, kind of similar to what Karen is talking about, developing a, a scale that we can apply to a variety based on the observations that we have, that we see in the field, uh, in how these plants respond to the heat stress. So we know that there's a lot of variability that we can see among these varieties in all of these different attributes that we're, that we're measuring. Uh, we get good correlation between these flower parameters and the end season retention and symmetry of the bowls. And then again, a good correlation between percent asymmetry, retention, and seed cotton yield. 
uh, both in 2020 and in 2021. Unfortunately, in 2019, the year we started this data was probably one of the least intense when it comes to heat stress that we'd seen in quite a few years. So we're focusing primarily on 2020 and 2021 data. We do have a publication out, uh, extension short, that kind of summarizes some of this. And again, our goal is to move forward with developing a, a scale that we feel comfortable with uh, applying to these varieties as we test them in our, in our advanced strains trials and also in our university trials that we have on grower fields across the, across the state. Want to thank all, we've got a small army of individuals that are out collecting this data. Uh, this is funded in part by Cotton Incorporated and by the participating seed companies, Bayer, Corteva, Americot, and BASF all, all, are all participating in the development of this, this work that we're doing. All right, I'm going to move on to nematodes and kind of finish up my presentation here today with some of the work that we're doing, looking at nematode control and management. Uh, just as a reminder, nematodes are parasitic roundworms, microscopic. They're not seen with the naked eye. They're obligate parasites, so they have to have a host in order for them to survive. They're soil-borne, and they infest healthy roots. And anything that the root does, it, uh, these nematodes can compromise. So water uptake, nutrient uptake. And oftentimes, when you have infestations of nematodes, what you see on the surface in terms of plant response could be something very similar to nutrient deficiencies or perhaps water stress. And, and oftentimes in certain areas of the state, those sim that symptomology is being caused by nematode infestations. So the main one that we deal with here in the state is uh, root knot nematode, Meloidogyne incognita is the main plant parasitic nematode that we deal with in the state. Here's some pictures, what it looks like. Again, they're microscopic, but if you pull up a plant, uh, if you're infested with root knot nematode, you'll be able to see the galling um, formations on the roots. I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. This is a, a pinto bean field, dry bean field in 2006. You definitely see the, the swellings. And then this picture on the right is a cotton plant, Pima cotton plant that I pulled up uh, two years ago, heavily infested with root knot nematode. Uh, you, you can tell pretty, pretty quick uh, the level of infestation in terms of, of galling on the roots. So what are some of our options for treatments? Uh, we do have some good nematicides out there, soil fumigants. Telone has been around for a very long time, and in my opinion, is kind of the gold standard when it comes to nematode uh, control and management. It's very effective in controlling root knot nematode at a five gallon per acre rate in cotton. Uh, it's not inexpensive. It's, it's kind of difficult to deal with as a soil fumigant, but it is very, very effective on root knot nematodes. And so that's kind of been our standard over the years. Here recently, we've, we've seen the introduction of some additional products, uh, flupyram, which is actually a, a fungicide, but has very good results and control suppression on root knot nematode. As a seed treatment, it is copio prime. We also have looked at a new product, well, not real new, it's been around for a few years, but BioST, which is a nematicide derived from a soil bacteria, Burkholderia renigensis. Uh, we're also looking at infro treatments, again, of flupyram, which is vellum. Uh, Aglogic, which uh, is formerly known as Temic. Uh, Temic is a great nematicide that we've, we've used over the years, and it is back. Uh, it is back now. My phone is ringing. Turn that off, sorry. Uh, we now have it as AgLogic, and we've been doing some evaluations of that product as well. The other thing that's, that's come about here uh, more recently, and there's been some talk about it already today in the meeting about variety susceptibility. Uh, there are a lot of varieties out there with some very good resistance and tolerance to uh, nematode infestation. Uh, some varieties can handle the infestation and still produce well. Uh, there are some varieties that actually uh, reduce the number of nematodes in the soil. And I'll show you some data here in just a minute, just because they aren't feeding on those, on those plants. So I'm going to present to you here real quickly just some, some data that we're looking at from our 2021 nematode management trial. This is a trial I do with Alex Hu. Uh, it's sponsored by National Cotton Council and Bear Crop Science. We had multiple locations across the cotton belt. Uh, the one location we had in Arizona was in Safford. We looked at two different varieties, a nematode susceptible variety, 1646, and a nematode resistant variety, 2141. We had an untreated control, looked at the BioSTC treatment, vellum one inferral, 
and then the ag logic inferral, and then the seed treatment of the copio prime, which is the food pyrant. So the next few slides are going to look very similar. Uh, on the left hand side, you're going to see the results for the nematode resistant variety, the 2141. And then on the right, you'll see the data for the 1646, which is the nematode susceptible varieties variety in this trial. And then along the bottom, you'll see the different treatments, the untreated control, and then the, the uh, additional treatments that we have. This is nematode counts in juveniles per 250 cc's of soil. Uh, you can see in the nematode resistant variety, we saw a significant decrease in the amount of nematodes. We still did see some in the untreated control at 97. And typically when you're in that range of over 100 juveniles, uh, you begin to see some significant impacts in yield in general, not always, but in general. Uh, with the nematode susceptible variety, we saw a lot higher concentrations of nematodes, but we did see fairly good control of nematodes. So these, these samples were taken at about mid-bloom um, when we collected these samples. So it was about 60 days into the, into the cropping season when we collected those. The other thing we looked at is, is uh, root infestation and uh, the presence of, of galling on the roots. Uh, this is the ZEC scale that we use, which is a scale of zero to one, with one being very minimal, all the way up to 10 being extreme pressure with root pruning and heavy galling. So these are our results. We didn't really see much over two and a half to three. We did see a difference in the nematode resistant variety as compared to the susceptible variety. But again, uh, not a whole lot of difference among the treatments, a little bit of suppression in some of the treatments in terms of galling as compared to the control, uh, but, but not, a, not a lot of difference in terms of, of galling. However, when it comes to yield, we did see some differences, some significant differences uh, among the, the nematode treatments and also between the two varieties. The nematode resistant variety, the 2141, generally had a higher yield. We did see good yield response with all of the treatments that were statistically significantly higher than the untreated control, as we did see in the 1646, with all of our treatments producing more uh, lint yield than the untreated control. And so I'm, I'm excited about what we're seeing with some of these new products. We're going to continue to do this work in 2022 and, and look at uh, this and some additional, uh, additional treatments that are still numbered compounds that aren't quite ready for public release. But there are some things coming down the pipeline that, uh, that I think are going to provide us some additional options in terms of, of nematode control and uh, management in the state. So with that, I, I just want to take a minute to thank all of the growers that we work with across the state, all of our variety trials. Uh, the, the strip trials are conducted on grower fields. We've got about 20 of those across the state. We couldn't do it without our grower cooperators collaborating. We really appreciate them allowing us to come onto their farms and work with them. Arizona Cotton Growers and the State Support Committee provide a significant amount of support to our program, allow us to do a lot of this work. And 